First and foremost, Minister, <coughs> welcome to the first Canada India Foundation event you are coming for us. Thank you very much for accepting. <laughs> Member of Parliament, Mr. Sandra, welcome and thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Mr. Khan from the Council General's Office is representing our Council General of India. Our Chair, Ajit Someshwar, my fellow friends from the Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce, the directors from there, thank you very much for coming and working and with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful evening, what a nice crowd we have. And Minister, you have in for a lot of questions. As you know, immigration is a very, very easy subject. <laughs> But he made it complicated. Uh, Minister Hussein's humble beginnings came from a reality shared by almost 70 million people. Guys, can you hear me? Okay. 70 million people displayed all around the world. He is one of the best examples of what the Canadian immigration and integration system can bring out in an individual who works hard and gives back to the society that supports. After being displaced from his home in Mogadishu, fleeing the Somalian civil war, and living in a refugee camp in Kenya, Mr. Hussein was able to immigrate to Canada while he was just tender age of 16. Am I right, Minister? He attended his high school here, and after which he got involved into public service. His work for the rehabilitation of Regent Park earned him the honor for the Queen's gold medal. He served as the national president of the Canadian Somali Congress, studied law from the University of Ottawa, and practiced in the areas of criminal def defense, immigration, refugee law, and human rights. The list goes on and on. When I with few of our Canada India Foundation members had gone to meet him, in December last year, we had an opportunity to hear from him. A very interesting story. Minister, I don't know if you remember, but you mentioned and related the experience when you visited the Dadaab camp in Kenya with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Mr. Filippo Grandi. He saw an opportunity with different refugees and how that particular camp had been built to provide entrepreneurship to those refugees, some of the refugees who built their life. They started earning, and I'm sure Minister will touch base and in details as to how and what he made them do this. That actually, you know, there was Girish, my colleague, Girish's idea that this is what people would love to hear in Canada. What happens in refugee camps? What happens? Why immigration is such an important issue? And which is the reason why we solicited and invited him that give us a date. And we were lucky and fortunate that today is the date. Thank you very much, Minister. <laughs> now, during the question and answer session, Ladies and gentlemen, I want to have one special request. Everybody, no personal questions. If your sister-in-law, mother-in-law, sister, wife, or anybody who's not got an immigration, you know what? You can ask that question. I will give you an email address, my email address, or you can send it to the Canada India Foundation email address. We'll forward it to Zubair, and Zubair will get you the answers wherever possible. But those questions should not be asked. This forum should not be used to ask personal questions. I would like you to ask any general question which is on principle related to the immigration issues. And Minister, I'm sure, would be very happy to answer that. I, I would like uh, MP Mr. Sangha to come and uh, convey his greetings. And after that, I would like uh, Mr. Saifullah Khan to say a couple of minutes of words of wisdom, and then we'll have the minister speak. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. 
Sandy Shah for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Honorable Minister Hussain for Immigration and Citizenship, Mr. Ajit Sumeshwar, Chair of uh, CAF, Anil Shah, and all directors and everybody who were present here. Good evening to everyone. It's right, rather great honor for me to be here in, 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 in your presence and getting the opportunity to talk to you. Being a chairperson of Canada India Parliamentary Friendship Group, I have got the close relationship with CIA. We work together for, on many fields, and I'm proud to say that Ajit Sumeshwar and El Shah, they gave me great honor to work with them and be part of the, their association. Today, we are lucky to have our minister here to address us the issues which are very important to, to everyone. Immigration is a field which is really important to us. But last government, they misused the Immigration Act. And then the form of the immigration, the total wires of the Immigration Act, total concept of the Immigration Act, which we have, Immigration Refugee Protection Act was totally changed. <clears throat> so it was so badly managed that there was a hue and cry in the communities regarding their dears, those who are not joining them, spousal sponsorship, parent sponsorship, you talk about anything, let's not talk about refugee only. Every system, even point system, entrepreneurship, all things were cut down. So one time I was talking, people say that uh, one scientist was there, you know. He wanted to see that how, how much frog can jump. So he draw a line cap, keep the frog there, made him to jump, and noted the length of the jump which he made. <coughs> then he cut his leg, frog's leg. He made him jump again. Still frog jumped. He cut the second leg. Still jumped. Third, fourth. So all the four legs of the immigration system was cut. So it was such a way. They were the scientists using the system, misusing the system. <laughs> so that's what I mean. So we are proud to say that our minister has brought the, again to such a standard that we all are happy and we are enjoying that new Immigration Refugee Protection Act changes. And uh, I'm thankful again. And uh, let's uh, ask maximum question to our minister who is very conversant in this. He's a lawyer by profession. He knows everything about the law. And unfortunately, these people never thought that Immigration Act is a law. They were not taking it as a law. So now let's work together and let's listen everyone and see how more improvements can be done. Thank you very much. If I can I'll invite Mr. Khan to come and say a couple of words from the Consul General's office. Minister of Im <coughs> Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, Honorable Ahmed D. Hussain, Mr. Ajit Someshwar, Chair, Canada India Foundation, Mr. Anil Shah, National Convener, Canada India Foundation, distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen, and friends. Uh, first of all, I would like to laud, or you can say congratulate CIF for selecting this topic and uh, inviting the minister to address this issue. And uh, this is something I think uh, CIF, uh, the efforts of CIF should be lauded by all of us. And uh, 
And I take this opportunity to thank him to invite the Consul General. In fact, the idea was to, for the Consul General to address the gathering, but uh, he had to leave for India for uh, some uh, pressing engagements. So he then asked me that if you are going, I took his permission that I want to attend because this is one subject where the consulate is not aware of how things, how things take place. So we should go and see, and since the minister is coming, we should listen to him for our own information on record, what the minister has to say on this subject. Then he said, if you are going, why don't you give my greetings to CIF for this effort? And uh, so I expressed my thanks for inviting me, and before that, the Consul General. And uh, there are a few things which I would just like to share with you. And also regarding uh, uh, our perception, there are certain issues which we have uh, br tried to bring to the notice of our our government regarding uh, the feedback which we have received from people here in Canada. First of all, I'd start with our relationship. India-Canada share a strategic partnership underpinned by shared values of democracy and pluralism. These have expanded significantly in recent years, aided by enhanced economic engagement regular high-level interactions, and long-standing people-to-people ties. Canada is home to over 1.3 million persons of Indian origin who comprise more than 3% of its population. The highly educated, affluent, and industrious PIOs one of, form one of the largest immigrant groups in Canada and are well integrated with the mainstream and are also active politically. The prime ministers of these two countries recently also resolved to facilitate the movement of highly skilled persons from India to Canada under the global skill strategy to, to fully harness the complementarity between their technical, technical capabilities and human resources. Regarding the feedback which we have, uh, I must add that most of the professions here in Canada are regulated. Uh, I understand primarily because of to protect public health and safety. Professions like engineers, doctors, architects, lawyers, early child educators, teachers, nurses, real estate agents, human resource <laughs> professionals, dentists, opticians, and among many others fall under these regulated professional categories. People coming to Canada on work permit have the advantage of having a job before arriving, but they have to go through the complex process of labor market impact assessment in order to have better export of services. Of service professionals, Canada should develop a mechanism of bringing degrees, qualifications, Indian qualifications, at parity of the Canadian market through easier, less complicated, and shorter certifications or exams. India and Canada can benefit from greater mobility of technology, trained workers, professionals, between both the countries. Uh, Mr. Shah is prompting that it appears that you are going to <laughs> make it a long speech. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, before I conclude, I'll just mention two things uh, which from the, uh, I think you should, because you should know about the initiatives taken up by the consulate for rendering uh, services to uh, Indian nationals. One is that we have started issuing long-term visas. Before, 
there were some security issues, not those issues have been addressed. The only thing is that if you want a five-year business visa or a 10-year business visa or a tourist visa, you have to come physically to the place where you are making the application because you have to give your biometric. So now we have started issuing long-term visas and you must be, many of you must be aware that we have our open house on Friday where without any appointment, you can come to the consulate between 9.30 and 12.30 in the morning in, and meet either the consul general or the officers concerned to address your grievances. So these are the two things I wanted to share with you. And I think uh, Mr. Shah, the minister, we are very eager to, uh, to listen to you and benefit from your observations, remarks, will carry your story back and see how we can make the observations which we get from you. Thank you so much, everybody. No problem. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we, without any further ado, can I invite the Minister Ahmed Hussain? Thank you very much. Uh, for the introduction, I want to, of course, uh, thank the Canada India Foundation for inviting me to this important uh, gathering and dialogue on immigration. I also want to thank uh, my colleague uh, in the House of Commons, Ramesh Sangha, who has uh, become a friend in a very short period of time and has, in addition to that, um, we have a, another common history. So before I became minister, I was sponsoring a, a private member's bill on community benefit agreements in infrastructure. And unfortunately, um, it, it went through first reading, second reading, it went through committee, it was coming back for the third reading vote before it went to the Senate and became law. And just before third reading, I was appointed to cabinet, so I couldn't finish the bill. So he's decided to take it on and he's doing an amazing job. Thank you very much. <laughs> This bill essentially will enable uh, co local communities to benefit whenever the federal government uh, builds or repairs, uh, uh, conducts maintenance or repair projects or building projects. It'll, uh, it'll have a, a community benefits lens to it and it'll also enable the federal government to uh, enter into those agreements with the provincial and municipal government so that if uh, the federal government is building something in this neighborhood that the first that you know the local community would be consulted to see what kind of benefits they would get so thank you for that i just want to start by talking about uh, canada india uh, as has been said already uh, two democracies two multicultural societies although india is way more multicultural than canada uh, uh, multilingual multi-religious societies uh, these are countries that have had long people-to-people -people relationships. 1.3 million uh, Indo-Canadians trace their ancestry to India, and that has ensured that the two countries enjoy very close diplomatic business and people-to-people and, and -people ties, and, and including education. And so, you know, the Indo-Canadian community is a great example of the story of immigration uh, to Canada how um, immigration has been the key to Canada's uh, current and past and future prosperity, both economically but also in terms of demographics and diversity and so on. So if you want to talk to anyone about immigration and you get challenged about the need for immigration in Canada, uh, the case is settled. You don't have to worry about making that case anymore. And I'll give you just one statistic to illustrate, among many, but just one for the sake of this discussion. In 1972, we had 6.6 uh, .6 working Canadians to support each retiree. <coughs> By 2012, that ratio had dropped to four working Canadians supporting each retiree. If we don't uh, continue to be ambitious in immigration in Canada, by 2036, which is less than 18 years from now, we will have a ratio of two working Canadians supporting each retiree. That's unsustainable. Uh, how will we be able to maintain our standard of living 
provide the public services that we all cherish, continue to shore up the healthcare system that Canadians uh, love? Uh, how do you maintain the pension plans that we care about? Let alone start new programs like a national pharmacare system. So in order to maintain a reasonable ratio of working adults to, to retirees, you know, one of the ways to do that, of course, is a higher birth rate, but the second way to do that in complementarity to that is through immigration. And if you want to see Canada in 2036, you don't have to wait till 2036. Just go to Newfoundland and Labrador, where you'll see that for every 100 working adults coming into the workforce, 125 are leaving and retiring. So you already have a gap of 25 people. For Newfoundland and Labrador today to maintain its, um, its, its, just its, its population and its, its working force, just to maintain what they have, let alone grow, they need 4,000 immigrants today. Um, New, Brunswick, New Brunswick's population is eight years older than the national average. And they've experienced for the first time a few years ago a population decline. So now they have a ministry uh, addressing that. So not just the Ministry of Immigration, but a ministry for, for demographics, for demographic growth, because they want to uh, deal with this uh, in a way that it's become very apparent to them. So you don't have to wait to, till 26, 2036. And that is why in Atlantic Canada we've introduced the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program so that we address not only the labor market and skills shortages there, but the real demographic challenges. Because you have a, uh, just like the rest of Canada, you have a, uh, an aging population with a low birth rate. So in the case for immigration is made. And when you look at the number of people who have come here, uh, between 2011 and between 2011 to 2016, um, we we welcomed in this country 100, of almost 150,000 permanent residents from India. And that five-year period, the number of uh, Indian nationals who came to become permanent residents in Canada is higher than any other five-year period in our history. And the trends that we see shows that that trend will only increase. And even for the temporary side, so if you look at January 2018, the number of temporary resident visas that were granted to Indian nationals is 100% more than the same period uh, last year. If you look at the number of uh, student permits that have been granted to Indian nationals, in January of this year, it's 161% more than the same time period last year, which was already an increase over 2016. So we're seeing not, not even a double digit uh, growth anymore, we're seeing triple digit growth in terms of the, of the percentages, which is a good thing. Because, uh, you know, as has been mentioned by, by, the, by, by the speaker before me, uh, global skills strategy. The highest number of users in that program uh, is, is our people from India. So the people-to-people -people ties are great. The business opportunities are there. Uh, and immigration is a key part of that. So my job is to make sure that as we welcome those business travelers, as we welcome those students and those tourists, that, a, uh, that immigration continues to be a facilitative ministry and not an obstacle to those real economic opportunities for Canada. And how do we do that? We do that by making sure that when there's a, a, a tremendous growth in the volumes of applicants, that we make sure that there's enough staff to deal with this, that we introduce efficiencies to make sure that uh, we make things easier for people, but also that we introduce facilitative programs to enable um, easy to, to process cases to just go through. So for example, we have a, a special program for business travelers from India where we facilitate their application and grant the visa in a, in a few days. So they're much lower than the average. 
uh, for Indian nationals who have had a visa in the past to Canada or who currently possess uh, a non-immigrant U.S. visa, we include them in the Canada Plus program, which again uh, makes sure that they're not asked a number of uh, more background information. Uh, so those facilitative measures will, will continue to have an impact, but we're seeing a record number of growth from all our uh, visa offices in India. In terms of international students, we are the first government in Canadian history to go out into the world and say to potential international students, not only do we say come to Canada and study, we tell them come to Canada and study and as many of you as possible should stay. We say that. Why? Because these are young people, they're keen, they're going to get an education at our institutions, they already speak English or French or both. Why would we not want to make these people Canadian citizens? And a good number of those people are from India. India consistently, together with China, uh, supplies the, the largest number of, uh, of students, of international students to Canadian institutions. And some of the ways in which we've been able to hang on to as many of those individuals as possible uh, is through making changes to the Express Entry program, for example. So now we're giving more points to international students under the Express Entry system, which has resulted in more of them becoming permanent residents and, and becoming the successful applicants under that system. We're very generous with international students. We allow them to work for up to 20 hours a week when the school is on, in session. When, uh, when school is closed for Christmas or summer breaks, we allow them to work full time. After they graduate, we allow them to work for up to three years with a postgraduate work permit, which coincidentally makes them eligible for permanent residency. Now, that is not a brain drain on India. It's actually uh, a win-win for both countries because those individuals, whether they become permanent residents or whether they go back, they will always have a link to both countries and they will improve the and add to the uh, business, innovation, and research ecosystem of both countries. And global skill strategy is another, um, another piece that we've put in place to make sure that if, you know, a Canadian company or an Indian company has branches in both countries, and they just want one of the senior executives to come and do short-term leadership training, that we don't ask them to do a work permit. It used to take seven months, and we used to ask them to do a work permit with all the red tape that goes with that. Now if you're doing that with intercompany transfers, you don't need a work permit. You just come and do your thing and go back. If you are coming to do research at, a, at an accredited institution or university in Canada, from anywhere in the world, including India, we don't ask you to get a work permit as long as you're coming here for up to 120 days. Because we value the contributions you'll make to our system and we know that you'll go back and add to that uh, ecosystem. And so it's a way for, for countries to have a win-win situation with respect to research and innovation. So the more we have programs like this, I think the more we can get into a situation where our immigration system continues to be a win-win for countries like Canada and India. Looking ahead, I think when you, when you look at the, the programs we have in place, but also the the kinds of success we've had in attracting international students, in attracting business travelers, in attracting tourists, we know that immigration will not, has not only provided for our prosperity and our demographic growth and our diversity in Canada, but it will continue to be uh, the difference maker for Canada globally in terms of ensuring that we remain competitive around the world. Our startup visa program was a pilot program. We've made it permanent because we want all those promising entrepreneurs to come to Canada and scale up to go from the $10 million company to a $500 million company because that's where the growth is and that's where the jobs are. And, you know, the, the thing that fascinates me the most is that if you look at the success stories we've had with, with immigration in terms of people coming here and actually creating jobs, 
and prosperity for Canadians. What's amazing is that there's so many of them that they're not unique anymore. Each one of them that I talk to, I think that they're unique. But if you look at the sheer number of those people, and they're everywhere in Canada, not just in the big cities, you are amazed at how newcomers have been able to really add to our economic growth and our common prosperity. But I'll just pick a few examples. There's a gentleman in, uh, in Saskatchewan who was able to go abroad, bring four temporary foreign workers, and start a small uh, business with a million dollar investment in Saskatchewan. And over the years has grown that company to a $2.6 billion annual revenue company and creates $4.5 billion in economic activity for Saskatchewan. Met another gentleman in Moncton, New Brunswick, small town. Um, came, to, came to Moncton with nothing, uh, saved enough as a busboy in the first year, bought a small pita making machine, turned that into a factory that employs uh, hundreds of people and, and 40 truck drivers, and is now investing in a second factory. And you know that keeps him busy for, uh, for nine to five, but I, you know, I asked him, what do you do on evenings and weekends? He said, I welcome newcomers and I volunteer with the local shelter and the local multicultural society. And he gives over a million dollars every six months to charity. Another gentleman who came with nothing opened, opened his first restaurant and now has a global chain of 65 restaurants. Him alone has hired over 1,800 at-risk youth. Another newcomer success story. And these are people who really value the fact that it is Canada and not any other country that allowed them to restart their lives and get a second chance to succeed. And they don't forget that and they give back in spades. The last point I'm going to make is that you know, um, there's this perception that the vast majority of the people we bring to Canada through our immigration system are refugees. Nothing could be further from the truth. 60% of our immigration numbers are economic. People who are coming here to bring their skills, their much needed skills, and, uh, and create jobs for all of us. And you keep seeing this, the software company uh, started by a Cuban immigrant in Saskatoon that I visited last week that has created 150 jobs for Canadians and is growing, right? And so 60% so of our immigration continues to be economic. 20% is family reunification. So spouses, parents, and grandparents. 14% of our immigration system is refugees. Government resettled refugees, private sponsored refugees, and the remainder are protected persons. So the perception out there is not actually true. Having said that, I'm proud of the fact that we have a refugee program because it's part of who we are. It's part of our humanitarian tradition. And we should never abandon that. We, in fact, we should double down because there is a great need, as you said, over 70 million people looking for safety and protection. But even they make a great contribution to our society. The Haddad family came, you know, privately sponsored uh, refugees from Syria, got settled by their family in uh, Antigonish, Nova Scotia. It's not a big place. There were chocolatiers back in Syria. They started their business again. In one year, they had opened a factory, hired 100 Canadians. They're now opening a second one and hiring many more. Uh, there was a Syrian family in Calgary, uh, where I think they started a bakery, employed a number of people. Um, but even those who are still kind of the refugees who are rebuilding their lives, they still contribute. You've heard of the refugees who are lining up when the uh, when the Fort McMurray force, uh, when the Fort McMurray fires happened, they were lining up to give blood and donations to the people, and so on. So you see this desire in a lot of newcomers, this hunger to succeed and make something of themselves and give back to the society that gave them a chance. And I see that all the time, wherever I go. But what I'm really excited about is how we in Canada are setting an example for the rest of the world in that part of our immigration system. So quietly, for 40 years, Canadians had this privately sponsored refugee system, which we all know, where groups of five Canadians or more can sponsor a refugee or a refugee family, or an organization can bring a refugee family here. That program is an amazing program. For 40 years, we never talked about it. 
Now other countries have discovered the benefits of that program and they're coming to us and saying, how can we learn from you how to do this? So last year we had the British coming and learning from us and eventually they were able to put together a program. And I was there to launch, help them launch the program. It's called the UK Refugee Community Scheme. I didn't like the word scheme. I thought it was a little <laughs> shady, but you know, they said that's British English for you, you know? So we didn't agree on the name, but everything else looked good, right? Uh, Germany announced a private sponsorship uh, program modeled on the Canadian version a few weeks ago. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina are quietly <coughs> studying that program. And Ireland was actually here a few weeks ago. There were some Irish officials uh, thinking about how they would start a program in Ireland. Uh, so we're quietly exporting that. But the second thing that I saw, which you talked about, is my experience visiting refugee camps. So what we're doing with the UNHCR is noticing that 90% of the people who are in refugee camps can be transitioned out if they have a pathway to permanent residency or citizenship in the host community. There's 10% of the community of refugees in refugee camps who will never leave because of disability or other reasons or their female he head of households who can't leave their children and so on. But 90% of refugees uh, can be transitioned out. And so what I was able to see is with a very small investment of $500 or less, People who would be transitioned out to get, a, to get a skill or would open a business with some little help. And they would, in a, in a very short period of time, they would, they would be out of the camp, they would settle into the community, and they would no longer need help from the UNHCR. What that means is we, our donor money can be redirected from that camp to, an, to, to you know, emerging crisis and continue uh, and having a bigger impact for less money. So that's one of the ways in which UNHCR and, and Canada and host communities are working on. Because as you know, we can't resettle everybody. The, the need is just too great. And not everyone is a candidate for resettlement. So the more you can help people on the ground, the better. And private companies are, uh, and foundations are also stepping up. So for example, the IKEA Foundation is working on creating jobs locally to give refugees a dignified job where they can actually work uh, and get dignity and meaning through work and, and produce goods and services that compete in the, in the global marketplace. So it's not charity, it's giving people an opportunity to help themselves. And, and that work is ongoing. So I want to end it there. I want to thank the Canada India Foundation for inviting me, for allowing me to talk about uh, our immigration system for and for allowing uh, you and I to have this um, exchange. So for the next, I don't know, uh, half an hour, 45 minutes, I'm your hostage. So go ahead. Actually, I have a few 17 questions myself, but I'll let everybody else ask you the first. Okay. Uh, start with something. So for personal cases, I would say we have members of parliament who work aggressively to help their constituents with immigration issues. And members of parliament have a direct line. They have a line called the MP inquiry line. They can tell you exactly where your case is at. They can tell you where the log jam is. And 90% of the cases they can solve, when they need our help, my minister's office help, they can also come to us and we intervene when there's reasons to do so. so my name is Ramesh Chotai, refugee from Uganda, Jambu Mana, Zulu Sandra. Idi Amina Fukuda Bibi, Paul Asana. What does that mean? He, he's saying, um, uh, he said hello in Swahili, I said hello, and then he said, you know, I'm from Uganda, Idi Amin chased me, I said, I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sorry about Canada. <laughs> Canada, Missouri, Sana, Kabisana, Missouri, Sana. Asante, sir. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. That was not French. <laughs> <laughs> I was not to try the either. <laughs>
I came here as a deputy from Uganda uh, under the Yes, when Pierre Elliott Trudeau was the Prime Minister, was picked up by Canadian Air Force Jet from Entebbe, brought to under Pierre Elliott Trudeau had the courage to tell Idi Amin that he will land at Entebbe Airport no matter what and if necessary, we blow up the tower. There were 31 flights leaving on the day that I was, uh, I was trying to escape. My flight number was CAF-029. Let's make it quick and sharp. Yeah. Please, there's so many people who are yeah, What I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go back into the history of refugees. You know, uh, Minister, there are a lot of people who say that Justin Trudeau is wrong in allowing so many refugees to come. I myself sponsored four Syrian refugees because I know you don't choose to be a refugee. Yes. You know? And these people need help. The four families that I sponsored are now all working. Well, you know, we are adding to the, and I thank you for the initiative that our government has taken. Thank you, Karen, for this opportunity, and thank you, Honorable Minister, and the same for such a great speech. My name is uh, Satyam Tiveri. Um, my question is uh, regarding, uh, it's a very famous question, it's about, uh, about amending the policy of uh, rejecting uh, immigration on regular grounds which uh, I believe is a very noble act, but uh, and you probably mentioned that uh, it's uh, discriminative and does not align with the Canadian values. Yeah. Uh, however, like what, uh, you know, measurement that you're taking that it does not affect our current health standard and the social services. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I didn't announce the change. I said, so basically the, the immigration committee has studied this. You have to understand, this is a policy that has been in place for 40 years, but it's a little bit out of step with our values. We, we include people with disabilities in our society. And the thresholds are very low. So the issue is, and by the way, what we're talking about is a very small number of people. So it, doesn't, it has a very negligible effect. So the issue is, how do we do it? Whether it needs to be done is no longer in question. It's how do we do it? So I would rather do it with the provinces as opposed to against them. So that's the process that's happening now. You'll hear about it very soon. The final result. Honorable Minister, I am Girish Kebre, yes. member of Canada India Foundation. First of all, I want to congratulate you to target at least one million permanent residents in the coming three years. Is there any policy whereby you can tell us, you will decide how each, from each demography or each location, mm -hmm. what? percentage from this one million will be allocated. So, uh, when it comes to the economic programs, we don't really look at where they're coming from. We just, it's based on who applies and who gets the points. It doesn't really matter where they're from. Uh, it just so happens that uh, we get most of our applicants from India and China, but that's because uh, I believe those are the two countries now that have a surplus of talent that they can afford to kind of, uh, and, and have enough of a population to, to, to have those people apply. But we get, you know, we get express entry successful applicants from everywhere. I mean, I, I, I just spoke about the, the software company that I visited last week. There was, it was like the United Nations. But the majority of the people that, that were getting the other jobs that were being created were Canadians. Well, in terms of the refugees though, we allocate our refugee numbers by continent, so, and it's equal, so for Africa, Asia, and, and Latin America. Right. Uh, before you ask the question, I have to ask. Yes. Those are the refugees. Privately sponsored, it's up to you. I have a question. Yes, of course. You know, when Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Modi had visited India, I'm in Canada, yeah. and at the time when uh, the Prime Minister of Mustafa was there, there was an announcement about visa on arrival for the Indians. Mm -hmm. 
That is one aspect. You mentioned in your presentation just now that for the business visa, Indians, there is a expedited. Yes, it's expedited. Unless you know it is not located. If it is. Because I have personally seen experience. People had to pay penalty for the tickets yes. because they could not fly. The visa was not delivered with the visa services. It's a challenge. Yeah. It's still a challenge and at least 15 to 30 days it takes yeah. for people to get the visas. So you need to look at something in that grounds for visa on arrival for Indian business people. Or who, who at least have even the American visa there. They have came here American visa. Why are you not giving him a visa on arrival? That's right. Fair, that's a fair point that we've spoken about. It. The, the, the expedited business service is working. It doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't capture some people who fall through the cracks, and that's unfortunate. The, the challenge we have with India and China is the volumes. Because, you know, we, ha we have a finite number of people, and then we have a, a huge growth in the volumes. I, I just mentioned in, in student visas, for example, 131% growth. So the, so, the issue, so the issue becomes not so much about deliberately you know, preventing someone from coming in. It's more of a question of being overwhelmed by the application. So we're always playing catch up, right? So the issue is how more can we, you know, you can only become efficient up to a point, right? At some point you run out of that room and you just need to invest more people, send more people there, and we're always doing that. But <laughs> the volumes are growing to, to uh, it's exponential. Good evening, Minister. It's a glad uh, to know that you have come and joined our group and uh, answer our questions. I'm uh, <coughs> the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I've opened for the last 15 years, and we discussed the different uh, you know, uh, in our chambers, you know, uh, duties and federal you know, uh, laws and uh, duties. Now, my question is, uh, my name is Josh Nava, and I'm open. My question is that uh, you think business people are encouraged to come here. Yes. What is uh, the criteria? How much investment they have to do before they can come here? And what areas they can come? I understand that they're supposed to be the Atlantic uh, area would have less our uh, land record would have uh, less uh, your money to come with, please answer that. So there's different uh, strings. It's hard to answer that question. If, if, you, if there's a, 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 a that's coming here with job creating investment, we have a separate team that fast tracks them. We have the startup visa, which is more about picking up that promising entrepreneur and having them grow here. There is the partnerships, you know, people coming and joining with another company. There are business travelers who are coming to, to explore partnerships with Canadian companies. So there's different streams. It really depends uh, which one you're talking about. I'm talking about uh, somebody who wants to come on his own. And yes. How much money he has to come up with. We don't have the entrepreneur. So you're talking about the entrepreneur visa. We don't have that anymore. It, it, the previous government got rid of that and the investor program. The province of Quebec still has it. But the rest of Canada, we don't have that program. There is an IIT program. Anybody in the program? Yes, in Quebec. We don't, we don't. Even here. We, we don't, like, the, even here. The government. Ontario has it. Ontario has it. I'm not familiar with that. I just know that yeah. Quebec has it. Provincial nominee program. The provincial, yeah, so they do it under the provincial nominee number. But I'm saying there is no standalone. No federal immigration. Right. Yes, sir, I have these wordings out there. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But I do have a, sorry, if I can continue yes. that line on the IIT program. Is immigrant investment program. Yes. What it reads, it says the experienced business people to contribute to Canada, long-term prosperity by investing in Canada's economy. <coughs> Investors must show that they have business experience, have a net worth of at least Canadian dollar 1.6 million, and invest. $800,000 
in an element will decide which province and where to invest. This is this is so. This is not a federal program. Are you it's a federal about, program, sir. No, uh, we, that, that was discontinued in 2011. Well, I just took it out from the website. Okay, today. Sure. This is uh, this is what used to exist, but it's no longer the case. We don't have a federal system. Right. A federal investor program. There's one in Quebec, which runs its own immigration system. But federally, the previous government you killed. Have one. Well, we can have that debate. And wants to invest, invest in my company. Okay. Just bring it on. One second, please. Wants to throw it and I put that money in, in my company. Yeah. And he says, okay, I want to have a guy come in working with you on your board mm -hmm. and at the same time be able to get an appear. How can you help us? Or could you help any of these investors? Who we, have? We, don't, we don't have an investor program anymore. What we have is if you're moving your company to Canada, and you're making that investment, we will give you PR and walk and, and your family and your workers and, and allow them to move here. But you have to demonstrate that job creation. They, yeah. No, but that is discussion to be had here. Sure, we can, we can have that discussion. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for coming here for the evening. Um, I think that's a big accomplishment and so on. Are you coming here on Friday evening? Thank you, CIA, for uh, having this event. My question. It's what I can do. Uh, my question to you is, um, uh, Mr. Like I am. Uh, my name is Pradeep Kungar, and I'm from Mississauga. I came over a decade ago. My wife came. Um, my parents and my in-laws immigration is in place. Yes, so that's the so I'm a live example of. I'll make it very short. That there is a need of more transparency in the overall immigration process. Okay. Transparency uh, in the communication to the stakeholders. Transparency in the same categorization, prioritization. Transparency in uh, uh, what the process is. Uh, okay. Like any other process or anything, there is always a chance of improvement. Yes, so, absolutely. Right? So, so I can talk about that. Yeah. So let me give you an example. The spousal program we had was cumbersome. There was too many forms, too many checklists, too many information. It used to take 26 months or more. It used to take three years or more. We brought down the spousal processing to under 12 months or less. You know how we did that? By simplifying the forms, by simplifying the checklists, by asking for less things. And now, 80% of spousal applications are processed in 12 months or less. We, we did it. We were able to do it. Parents get the same thing. We used to have over 100,000 in backlog. We now have less than 20,000. So we were able to clear about 80,000 from the backlog. We're working on this. But spousal is a, is a good success story and an example of what you're talking about. Uh, Thank you, Minister. Uh, I'm Mr. Kumar. I'm from Brampton. And I have a very specific two short question. I know that wherever you go, the hard question will follow you because it's an immigration matter. Okay. Um, since I've been reading the immigration policy for the family reunification, yeah. where the parent and grandparent, yeah. I still was not able to understand that what the method, method is used for the three years income requirement to qualify and why. Three years, everything that is not being used, when it's a matter of money. Because uh, uh, the, the, the sponsor need to have the proof, the financial stability, that can be proved the three years of using average income, not particular year fixed number income. So what's your question? My question is that in parent and grandparent, why the three years of average income is not being used? As opposed to? Uh, yes. As opposed to what? As opposed to what now? We are using just fixed set of the income for every last past three years of the row. So there's a set of income we are using 14 to qualification for parent grandparent, say 14, 15, and 16. The income requirement for the people is should be whatever the number is there, 60,000, 62,000, or 64,000. If any particular sponsor are not able to make 
or 60,000 if he is able to make just 59,000 on 2014, but he is making in 2017 100,000. So you are the average. Correct. Okay, so let me speak about the time gap time program. We promise two things in that program. One is that we will double the number. So the number of slots were only 5,000. We said we will double it. We have. Have we doubled it? We have. We've gone from 5,000 to 10,000 spots. The second thing we said we'll do is we will make a fair system. In the past, if you're willing to spend more money than the next guy, you would be first in line. Or if you lived closer to the processing center by postal code, you would have a more advantage over the next person. That's not a fair system. So we've changed that system to have a more of an even playing field. The third thing we said we'll do is, is really try to clear that backlog because the backlog was also making the processing take a long time. What the conservatives did is they had a backlog of, of, of over 100,000. I think their backlog was something like 127,000. They just didn't care. It's the same thing. They had 75,000 spouses in a backlog. They had 65,000 uh, live-in caregivers in a backlog. The, the, last, the previous government did not treat people. Like, this is about people. When you put people in a backlog for years and years, waiting for five years or more, you're hurting people. You're keeping families apart. And so our priority, we couldn't fix the broken immigration system that Ramesh talked about. We couldn't fix that in a year. But what, what we said is, when we got into government, we said we will tackle the three, the, the three priorities, spousal, caregivers, and parents and grandparents. So what, what have we done? Spousal, we went from three years to 12 months. And we've, went, we've gone from a, a backlog of 75,000 spouses to 15,000. That means 60,000 spouses are now together because of our efforts. Wow. That's a fact. That's not, that's, not, that's not my opinion. That's a fact. Same thing with parents, grandparents, 100,000 parents, grandparents. And, and same thing with living caregivers. The issue is, can we improve? Like the, you, I like your idea. If you think that's a better idea, send me an email. We'll take a look at it to consultations at cic.gc.ca. Honorable Minister, my name is Neelam Puri. I worked 29 years at United Nations, New York. I took early retirement in 2014 to unite with my children in Canada, citizen for 20 years. But uh, under the new immigration policy for parent and grandparent, yes. you now need a lock of draw. Yeah. I understand. An invitation to uh, sponsor your parent and grandparent. So when is the date of lottery announcement, number one? Okay. Number two, uh, I need to suggest that income eligibility should be based on the aggregate income of the sponsor and sponsoree, not the sponsor alone. This can rule out uh, that no one becomes a public charge, I understand. Uh, or as despite our collective net worth of about a million dollars, we may still disqualify if you are taking the average of last two years' income. Uh, so what good is accumulating uh, such a lot of income after retirement working from United Nations if I cannot reunite with my children? I am staying in New York, so close here but so far away from children. I, I, I didn't know that the UN was paying millions. Maybe I. <laughs> 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 yeah. so, it's a collective work. That was a. That was a. I would accept a few. But what I'm saying is, for the random selection process, I think one of the things we learned last year, we ran a number of draws, even though people were complaining that there weren't enough spots, we couldn't find uh, 10,000 people. I think we landed at. A, a little bit over 9,000. So I think one of the things we found out is a lot of people who want to sponsor are not eligible. They can't support, they, have, they don't have the financial means. So what we are attempting to do this year is still have the random selection process, but don't allow anybody into the lottery who doesn't meet that threshold, which means that only the, the people who will be in the lottery are people who can actually, uh, if they get picked, people who will actually be qualified to, uh, to sponsor. The second thing. No, I'm saying the lottery itself should be filtered before the lottery begins, which is something we didn't 
you know, last, last year was the first time we did this, so we learned from that. Right. Because some of the people that were picked from the lottery, when we said, okay, now we invite you to sponsor, they couldn't do it because they didn't have the income threshold, right? So I think one of the things we're doing differently this year is to make sure that we filter that beforehand before the lottery begins. I like your idea of averaging out the income. We'll see what we can do with that. When you allow, you two brothers are leaving, you allow the to sponsor the each parent separate. Yeah. So what what is the lottery date? Please, please, please. She'll give you. I'll get you. Uh, hi, Hello. honorable minister. My question is very quick. Uh, in the same situation she described, if the parents are landed immigrants and they have to surrender their immigration after 10 months of staying in Canada because they cannot fulfill the three-year requirement of permanent residency. And then they have to go to states and then now they come back after 20 years. So is it fair that they have to apply for immigration all over again? Is there any way those 10 months they stayed as uh, landed immigrants can be counted? and they can be given um, a leverage because they've already stayed 10 months out of the three years as landed immigrants? I'm not sure, that, that's a good question. I think part of the reason I'm here is not just to give you an update and answer questions. It's also to, to hear from the community on what works and what doesn't work. So for example, the idea that we should average out the income, that's an interesting idea that I will easily take back to my office and see what we can do with that. So. I, I, you know, the, so I don't have all the answers, and so some of these ideas will, will feed into what we're trying to do in terms of moving forward. But in terms of the, that number, I think with the changes to C6, we do count the time that you spend in Canada prior to becoming PR. After you become PR, that's another story. But uh, I, I think there's some flexibility there. Yeah, Excuse me, one second. I, I want to interrupt you one second, please. Ladies and gentlemen, let me be very frank. He has a time constraint. So I'm going to ask, you can ask three questions, and all three questions he'll answer together. We have 15 more minutes because before that he has to call. So please, are you asked to finish the question? Can you please give it to him? Yeah, we could finish it very quickly. So if their ages are like 63 and 70, so now we would again you know, start from the scratch and do the three-year requirement, or is there any way to bump them up the line? Because they've already served 10, 10 months out of that already. No, they don't have to apply, yeah. All over, yeah. <laughs> is there a status of the parental immigration Sorry. boundaries when are they coming? Sorry. Uh, Sorry. We're going to have three questions at a time, and then you answer all three. Sure, sure. OK, that's easy. Honorable Minister, you touched upon the subject of uh, immigration as far as uh, the countries of New Zealand, Austria, Chile, Argentina, etc. So I just wanted to talk to you, uh, just ask this question more about the globally. What is happening that the human rights issue you see that historically has been happening all, all along, thousands of years since. But it has been mainly from north to south, maybe because of, by means of maybe military advancements. However, in current scenario, there are two mutually contradictory aspects are there. One, the, ethnic, the identification of an individual on the basis of ethnicity. And secondly, on original, as an immigrant from original national. And other way, the industrial, industrial hemisphere is facing the issue of the demographic challenges. So how to address these mutually contradictory aspects? I, 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 don't, I don't know what the question was there. I, I, I want to I be fair to you. So, yeah, because I want to be able to give you an answer, but I don't question. understand the question. So the, the question. The question is here, the industry, industrial countries are facing challenges, the demographic challenges. Like us, we are facing them. At the same time, at the same time there is a strong identification of individuals on the base Place of nationhood or where you are from. Or where. Basically saying that... Uh, so, so, so like the countries, uh, the 
original nationals, yeah. they think that... We'll have so much from here, so much from there. Many, many countries, they face this, like, they difficult countries. Do you understand the question? I don't understand any questions. Sorry. No, no, no. Maybe, maybe I, when I get to the mic, I will. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Honorable Minister. I didn't write it, though. Uh, <laughs> I'm Jai Kalevar from Davenport, right next to yours. Yeah, we met before. Yes. I yeah. met him 30 you years ago. I really don't have time. Okay, so I don't need, I don't want you uh, to. I, uh, Communist Party. But firstly, you are the first minister I'm meeting. I would really like to ask this question to Mr. Freeman. But I will ask you. I was in, one week ago, I was in Bangkok attending a conference on SDG. SDG, by the way, is Sustainable Development Goals. And it was a three-day conference. I attended the first day, and I raised some money. I'm going to interrupt. Please, you don't understand if you're running out of time. Please ask the question. The question is, on second and third day, I was not allowed in. And it is a question of my participation at a UN conference. And I feel as my freedom of speech was denied on two days out of three. And how do you deal with it? I leave to your legal well, expertise. You are really, really bad questions. Yeah, yeah. This is not a question you think about. I ask you, I give you a challenge to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, Minister, you got the question? No, no, no. Ask only one question. I'll leave, I'll leave. Very small. And I don't want to waste the time. Thank you. My name is Devinder Bhatia. Thank you, CIA, for inviting. Honorable uh, Minister, I have a specific question for the business purpose. Education is our one of the important income source. Yes. Now the students are coming. We have two demarcations, which is community college and private career college. And for the private career college, our ministry issue ISP board. But still, they are not eligible for applying the immigration. Why this has been so badly? Because ultimately, I want to give a consideration because I am the owner of ISP. So my question is that when we want to develop business, we should give some development. So, thank you. Just seriously, the last question, and then you answer all together. Okay, good question. I'm from Radio Station. Talking about social development, we have a a simple question for the people get the super visa when they come here they don't have an opportunity to work with in the society so they are dependent on the on the kids so is it possible to give them some time 10 15 20 hours to work uh, and that will be access to Canada and that will be they can live with the dignity they can live with the honor so that will be also access for Canada okay Minister, please answer those yes, three so, questions uh, and then uh, two uh, more, two yes. more sessions of three yeah, questions. Absolutely. Please. So I, I don't know why you were prevented from continuing your conference. So I, I, without knowing the details, I can't really answer. I don't know why that happened. I don't uh, know why either. Okay. So on the private, uh, on the postgraduate work permit for private colleges, this is something I've heard. Uh, I mean, there was a reason why. It was limited to public institutions because the, the vast majority of our international students go to public institutions. I think it was a question of also quality control. But I've, I've heard, this is not the first time I've heard this. I've heard that it should be extended to some private colleges. There has to be a link between the, the no, but also the, the programming at those private colleges and the employability of the, of the international students. If you can prove to me that that uh, that transition to a job is just as good as the public institutions, then we should get rid of the, of, the, of, the, of the limitation. If not, then we have to keep the law as it is. So I put it to you. I'm open-minded on this. If you can provide me with a proposal that shows that you are providing access to the labor market just as well as the public, we will give them a work permit. Okay. In terms of the super visa, uh, I disagree with the premise of the question. By inviting someone on a super visa, you're taking responsibility for their upkeep. So they shouldn't be needing to work. You should be supporting them. If you cannot support them, don't invite them to Canada. Good one. Okay, next question. Honorable Minister, the refugee is back again. Yes. 
The students coming here, uh, I mean students visa, are experiencing tremendous problems when they get the work permit. The work permit is only for four years and is not renewable. No, but uh, the work permit is for three years, up to three years, yeah. and, it, and they can, if you work in Canada for three years, you're eligible to get PR. You so are eligible? Yes, so they usually transition to PR, so there's no problem there. This question but is, cannot, yeah. but the work permit cannot be extended. No, but they become PR, so they don't need, you know, they don't need a work permit. No, they have to apply for PR, but they usually get it because they've been working in Canada for okay, next three years. Okay. Next question, please. Yeah, so um, global skills strategy is actually not a pilot, it's a real program. It's been going really well. I talked to employers across the country and the, I asked them, is it really 10 days? Because when you're sitting in Ottawa and the department is telling you it's 10 days, I wanted to see and all the employers say, yes, it's 10 days or less, 10 days or less. So it's, it's working very well. Uh, in terms of expanding it to other no codes, that's a, really a question for EHDC. Uh, but from our end, it's working very well. The processing is, is fast. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Just uh, one quick uh, comment. Uh, quick quick uh, comment. Uh, and I'll be the last question. Uh, that the language has been given an extremely uh, important role in the new immigration system. Not only that, it is important as a language, but it is also combined with the experience and education. And uh, my question is that I've seen many successful people working in a global corporation failing because of this combo of education and language and experience in language plus the language. So is it really working uh, in your opinion? Yeah, so for the express entry system, we have a, a number of factors. We're always tweaking that system. So for example, in the past, uh, people, were, people with a job offer were disproportionately represented in the, in the final successful applicants. So having a job offer counted more for everything except uh, instead of you know, language and educational background and so on. We thought that was a little disproportional. So you still get some points on the job offer, but now we've balanced it out. We give you a little bit more. Uh, if you uh, are educated, your educational background, your work experience, but also now we're giving you more points if you have family in Canada. If you have siblings in Canada, we give you more points because we know that if you have a sibling in Canada, or siblings, you're more likely to succeed faster and integrate faster and quicker than someone who doesn't. Right. So we're always tweaking that system and we're gonna examine uh, how that balance is to work. Thank you very I much. Two more minutes. I'm gonna ask our chair, Adit, to come up here. And then after that, I want all the staff members, I want to thank them for all their support. And particularly, I want to thank Suda. He was the assistant to Susan Mary. And I got her back to work for CIF on an interim basis to help me out, to get, make sure that everything works smoothly. So it's her, my other colleagues, Rizal here, and my assistant, Sivana. Yeah. We have one formal session we have to take before you go. Okay, Please. No Ajit, you want to say one of the next uh, No, you know what? Guys, uh, I just want to thank the Minister for being here. I really uh, am thankful for the Canada India Foundation to make the speaker series such a success. We've had very important programming to the speaker series. Every two months we have an illustrious speaker coming. And today, Minister Hussain has really showed us how Canada as a country cares but at the same time, it takes care of its own as well. So I like that, and thank you very much, Minister, for being here. Thank you, uh, MP Sangha, for being supportive of us. And uh, let me not forget to say that in July 5th and 6th, we have an education forum. And the education forum will have a host of subjects that will benefit 
and the integration will be a good part of that. And we also have a lot on the stage. And we have a lot on the stage. So I, I want all of you guys to come for the forum. Come for the gala, and I want the minister and his deep pocketbooks to support the education board.